one of the <coughs> quantities that we have a temperature standard. <coughs> and these absolute temperature measurements are made only in the few labs around the world. Uh, among them is the National Bureau of Standards, close to Washington, D.C. <coughs> oh, where is my uh, <laughs> private? Thanks a lot. <coughs> so constant volume gas thermometer is used, uh, which the pressure of a fixed volume of uh, inert gas is measured as a function of temperature. So this is the basis for the thermodynamic scale of temperature. Practically, practically, in uh, average university labs, we are using fixed scale of temperature, fixed scale of temperature, and this is sufficient to, uh, from engineering point of view, to calibrate any type of temperature sensor. So, this is the international practical scale of temperature. These points could be easily reproduced. We have a scale between minus 100 uh, 82 degrees centigrade to uh, over 1000 degrees centigrade from boiling point of oxygen, triple point of water, zero boiling point of water, boiling point of sulfur, as to freezing point of gold. This is fixed points. Fixed points. We can reproduce them in our lab and uh, we can uh, calibrate any type of sensor. There are numerous types of sensors. You remember my remark when I said that uh, we cannot trust glossy brochures uh, published by sensor manufacturers because the major role is to sell the product. We have to be very critical regarding their products. So I will, we will discuss again selection of the right sensor for the particular uh, measuring task. Temperature sensor, few classes. Resistive, the major class is resistive, metal, metallic alloys and semiconductor base. Thermoelectric, thermocouples, and solid state based on pin junctions and others, and others. The major groups of temperature sensors. Resistive temperature sensors. This is the first group. Uh, why a wand resistor? This is non-inductive wand or coil of suitable metal wire, usually platinum, copper, or nickel. They are encapsulated in a glass rod in the form of the probe. Now, if you look at the structure of this transistor, of this uh, t temperature sensor, what do you think about its dynamic properties? Good or not? What do you think? What is your opinion? What we can expect from this type of sensor? On the base of the information which I delivered. What size is this? Is the sensor? Size is substantial. Yes. Size is substantial. It's not a miniaturized sensor. Yeah. It's not a miniaturized sensor. It's rather bulky. So this is the main reason why we cannot expect good dynamic properties. Not only this. Please look that the sensing element, which is this wire wound resistor, is encapsulated and uh, is encapsulated. Uh, and what does it mean? That for the, to reach the thermal equilibrium, time is needed. And as a result, response and recovery time will be not very impressive. However, when we are using, when we are using platinum as a wire, we can expect very good long-term stability long-term stability, that's right. In the case of copper or, or uh, nickel,
cycle, long-term stability will be not so good. Resistance, uh, as we already said, from an engineering point of view, around 100 ohms, this is the best value. No more than one kilo ohm, because in this case we have no shielding problems, no uh, in electromagnetic interference, uh, and uh, uh, no problem with connecting wires. The relationship between resistance and temperature is non-linear, non-linear, but uh, these beta and uh, gamma coefficients are very small. They are orders 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 12. So practically, practically linearity is not so bad. Not so bad. Now, sensitivity, sensitivity is relatively small because we have a sensitivity uh, 0.4 ohm per degree centigrade for platinum, 0.7 for uh, degree centigrade for nickel, for 100 tons. Characteristics, calibration curves, resistance versus temperature for metals, for metals, uh, as I said, platinum linearity is not so bad from uh, copper and nickel, it's worse linearity, worse linearity. Now, this type of sensors are operating in Wheatstone Bridge in order to get the voltage output signal. And if the uh, connection wire uh, resistance is a problem, we are using constant current source excitation. We can partly compensate the influence of, of uh, uh, connection wire resistance. Now, improved devices, we can integrate, integrate, uh, we can design integrated version. So in this case, we have a rectangular matrix of platinum deposited on a ceramic substrate. Uh, in the case of a mass production, laser trim is Trimming is used in order to produce a precise value of resistance for uh, whole volume of production. So it's a miniature platinum resistance temperature sensor. Of course, in this case, we can expect better dynamic performance because dimensions are smaller and thermal equilibrium is reached much faster much faster. And this type of device is produced in millions of pieces. So in general, uh, they are uh, characterized by good stability, good reproducibility in the case of platinum, worse for nickel and copper, high linearity for, for uh, uh, the, in the case of platinum, temperature range for nickel and copper minus 200 to plus, to plus 300. For platinum, of course, up to 900 degrees centigrade. So it shows clearly that when we are dealing with any type of sensor, any type of sensor, including chemical biosensors, we have to take into account material science, which sort of materials we are using, what sort of properties do they have, and it will affect substantially the sensor performance. Looking at the materials, we can conclude a lot. And I already mentioned, I already mentioned that <clears throat> basic knowledge in material science is necessary, is necessary because for instance, if we have this basic knowledge, we will never use silver in a sense of technology. We will never use silver. Because any type of sensor containing silver elements will have poor 
short and long term stability. The results are not very reliable. Disadvantages of this type of sensors. Disadvantages. Low sensitivity. And uh, for the first for the first design, this is a large dimensions, resulting in a long high time constant. This is the first group. The second group, thermistors. Thermistors. Small semiconducting devices made by sintering mixtures of oxides, of materials usually like cobalt, nickel, uh, manganese, usually encapsulated in glass. So again, if this is encapsulated in glass, we cannot expect good dynamic properties even if they are relatively uh, miniature. They are inherently non-linear, non-linear. Resistance at room temperature between few hundred ohms and several megaohms. Typical value around 10 kilo ohms. Sensitivity is huge, huge. One kilo ohm per degree centigrade. One kilo ohm per degree centigrade. We have two types of these sensors with negative temperature coefficient and positive temperature coefficient. But from engineering point of view, the absolute value is important, so it is irrelevant. It's positive or negative. It has some meaning for uh, signal processing uh, that uh, we can use differential mode of operation and we can increase the output signal. Non-linear, we already discussed that non-linearity is not a problem because we can linearize transfer characteristic by electronic means. And in the case of thermistors, temperature sensor manufacturers are offering us uh, electronic linearizers. Usually this type of device operates in a, a bridge circuit. So we have in a one of the arms of the Whitson bridge, there is a, a thermistor, others resistors. And we can come in this case, we can get the output signal in the form of voltage. And uh, we can calculate what sort of what the range of the output signal will be. So for these values, look, sensitivity is really enormous is one volt per degree centigrade. One volt per degree centigrade. So again, we see the trade-off. The first glass, uh, uh, we have an excellent sensitivity. But what does it mean? It means that accuracy of our measurement will be not so very high. Because there is always problem disparity between these two parameters. They are, they are antagonistic uh, to each other. Uh, what does it mean? The threshold, threshold look, can be very small. 0 0.01 degrees centigrade. Because we have, we have a huge, huge sensitivity. We cannot get such a threshold with platinum-based resistive temperature sensor. Yeah? So looking at the sensor, we can immediately conclude what we can expect, what sort, of, what sort of parameters, both static and dynamic, we can expect. Now, what we can expect from the repetibility point of view? What do you think? It will be good or, or let's say, for platinum based resistive temperature sensor. Repetibility, what do you think? What we can achieve? This is the sensor thinking, yes? What we can achieve, good or not, not so good? Platinum is a noble metal, yeah? yeah. 
noble metal, very stable, chemically very stable. Yeah? So we can achieve very good repetibility. Thermistor, mixtures of oxides. Mixtures of different oxides. They are numerous compositions. God knows how they will behave at the function, function of time. Yeah? Measurements done today could be measurement results obtained today could be completely different in a, in a two months time. Yeah? Stability, not so good. Now, next, long-term stability. Let's compare both, platinum and thermistors. What do you think? Both, short and long-term stability. Early morning is very yeah. Is very different. Is very For platinum? For platinum. Platinum, excellent. Excellent, stability. Long, short and long term stability. For thermistors, probably we can obtain short term stability, not very good, bad, but for long term stability, uh, we cannot expect. Uh, good results. We cannot expect good results. But, but, look, when I presented toward the end of the yesterday lecture, when I presented the, this dreaming list of numerous parameters, I said the one, one parameter is missed from this list. It was the cost. Cost, yeah? Cost. <coughs> Let me tell you something. One of the current trends in sensor technology is to use the so-called, is to employ the so-called one-use sensor. If we are able to manufacture sensors in millions of pieces, if the sensor cost is one cent or three cents, I can use it once and throw it away. That's right? I cannot do this in the case, example I delivered with intracranial pressure sensor, it costs $700. I cannot use it once. I have to have excellent long-term stability. But one use sensor, what does it mean? In biosensing field, in biosensing field, it's a good idea when there is a hospital screening hospital screening, many patients are coming mm -hmm. for analysis. It's a good idea to use the sensor once and throw it away. Yeah. Do not pay any attention to calibration because we have to understand one thing, that in, in this business, recalibration is important. We have to be sure mm -hmm. that calibration card obtained today today, output-input relationship, is valid mm -hmm. tomorrow or in a one-year period of time. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean? We have to recalibrate sensors. Recalibrate sensors. In some cases, in some cases, it's a very difficult task. Because, for instance, if the biosensor is, is implanted to our body, biosensor, to measure, for instance, concentration of potassium ions or some other parameters. We cannot do the operation, remove sensor, recalibrate and, and Im 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 implanting this tool again. Mm -hmm. This is completely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So we have to have this, all these situations in mind. So they are thermistors. Uh, they are commercially available linearizers, very simple linearizers composed of different combination of resistors. They are helping us to linearize transfer characteristics. They are manufactured for different ranges of temperature and uh, uh, what is really important in this case, the so-called interchangeability. So we can obtain uh, 
we can obtain this parameter uh, plus minus 0.15 degrees centigrade. It's possible to obtain. It's not so bad. Not so bad. Thermocouples. Thermocouples. Based on a well-known Zeebeck effect, we can we can design thermocouple in our lab easily. Yeah. Some thermocouples. Junction connection of two dissimilar metal wires. If the wires are joined at both ends and one end is heated, there will be a continuous flow of current in the circuit. But if the circuit is open, then the open circuit voltage, the open circuit voltage is a Zeebeck voltage. Zeebeck voltage. And this voltage is directly proportional to the junction temperature. Now let's look at this element. Dynamic properties. What do you think? Very good. Because this is a sensing element. The junction between these two metals. Miniaturized. Very miniature. Temperature equilibrium. When we are changing temperature. Could be obtained very fast. Temperature Dynamic performance, both response and recovery time, very good, very good. But again, trade-off, trade-off. Nothing is for free. Static properties, sensitivity, sensitivity, very poor, very poor. So, uh, nothing is for free. Uh, now, what else? What else? Uh, let's. This is too early to ask this question. Of course, during the early stage of research on Zeebeck effect, people are putting people. Are, we need a reference junction. We need a reference junction. Mm -hmm. Because from electronic engineering point of view, the system cannot be floating. We need a reference. Mm -hmm. We have to measure temperature compared to this reference level. So we need a reference junction. In the early stage of research on Zeebeck effect, people are putting, uh, people are using uh, beaker with a uh, iced water. Mm -hmm. So it was known as a zero temperature. But from practical point of view, it's not very convenient, mm -hmm. so they are better methods, better methods. Uh, uh, Rajesh, sorry, uh, Krishna will copy this, so you can, you can study. Uh, we have a, a, a practical arrangement. We are using, we are using uh, electronic means to build a reference junction. Electronic means, it's very convenient. So you can read this slide. Thermocouples, now, calibration card. Variation of the Zeebeck coefficient with temperatures. Uh, the most widely, the most popular, copper constanta. So we can do this ourselves in our lab. Soldiering two wires, copper and constanta. We have chromal alumel. We have combination with platinum and rhodium, platinum rhodium alloy. They are standard device. So the output signal, the calibration curve is not, not, not linear. The output signal is very low, ranging between 10 microvolts per degree centigrade to 80 microvolts per degree centigrade. Now, depending on the material used, we can select the right temperature range. We can do the job for temperatures around room temperature. We can do this to the very high temperatures using by the steel industry above 2000 degrees centigrade. So, for some alloys, 
and playing tungsten, we can get high temperature range and very good dynamic properties. There are different combinations, different combinations used. The battery is weak. Which one? No. It worked. Okay. We have different combinations of different thermocouples. We are obtaining different temperature range and we have obtaining different sensitivity. There is a Seebeck coefficients are listed here. Now, even, look, even if the output signal is so low, when we are measuring high temperatures above 2000 degrees centigrade, the output signal will be substantial, yeah? will be substantial because if there is a, let's say, 80 microvolts per degree centigrade, for 2,000 degree centigrade will be pretty high. So, this element, again, calibration cars, some of them are more linear than others, very cheap elements, low cost elements, we agree, do not use the term cheap, we use the, the term low cost, simple, simple and powerful. Simple and powerful. Now, general remark, general remark. I tell you something, many people around the world, in different laboratories, sometimes happens even in a very rich countries like Germany. I know few teams in Germany, few teams in Germany, to be specific, there is a team in Karlsruhe, they are working on surface acoustic wave based biosensors in liquid medium. And they have no fabrication facility. They have no fabrication facilities because they are oriented in a different direction. So what they are doing, and this is the, this is many times is the best solution. What they are doing, they are buying, they are buying surface acoustic wave delay lines, because as you know, every TV set, every TV set contains surface acoustic wave based delay lines, oscillators, commercially available elements developed for telecommunication industry. And they are manufactured in millions of pieces. <coughs> As a result, they are elements of the low cost. So what they are doing? They are buying such an element, taking package out, immobilizing, for instance, antibodies on the surface and measuring the concentration of corresponding antigens. The same story with yesterday example. Buying, buying uh, quartz crystal microbalance, bulk wave device, commercially available and employing for sensing applications or buying piece of fiber or buying ordinary MISFET, metal insulator field effect transistor used by electronic people for signal processing <coughs> applications. Removing package and playing the game with the device. Using this for, for gas sensing applications or for biosensing applications. So we have to always look at different opportunities on the market because in many cases other industries other than sensor technology industry, they develop elements which are of the low cost and easily available. So you don't need, in reality, you don't need, of course it's nice to have a good clean room and all these facilities and so on, so on. but if I have not such facilities, 
I have to find out the solution. The solution is to buy commercially available elements and to adapt them for sensing applications. And you can get very good results. The Dr. Rapp from Karlsruhe is buying 40, 430 megahertz uh, surface acoustic wave ba based delay lines and he is producing very high quality papers, highly cited in literature. Not bothering about manufacture, about fabrication. You can do the same. You can do the same. This is the practical approach, practical approach, yeah? This is about being positive. That's right? This is about being positive. So, what we can do, look, PN Junction is a wonderful device. It was developed by uh, 1947, Bell Lab, who developed PN Junction, Alejandro. Mm -hmm. There were three persons there. Yeah, but the major author was Schottky. Schottky, Schottky. They develop, but yeah, as usual, you know, three people working very hard, but two of them forgotten. Yeah, mm -hmm. and one of them is taking, taking the glory <laughs> from this. Schottky, 1947, so it's 53 plus 13, so it's a 66 years. Let me make a remark. This, is, this, this PN junction is widely used by electronics people, electronic engineers. But there is a paradox, because physics of the PN junction forward bias is well understood, very well understood. But physics of the PN junction in reverse bias, especially in breakdown region, especially for avalanche or zener breakdown, is still not fully understood. There are many question marks. But this is wonderful element, wonderful element, because I can buy it for five cents, I can take a package out, I can use it for many appli sensing applications. Of course, very obvious, of, one of them, very obvious, is to measure temperature. It's to measure temperature. And uh, fortunately, fortunately, this is a current voltage characteristic of a PN junction. In the forward, reverse, uh, forward or reverse bias. I can use the either I can work I can work in uh, different regions. I can use constant current mode of operation. And when temperature varies, when temperature varies, of course this characteristic will shift, will shift, and this is my output signal in this case, which is voltage shift. So calibration curve will be voltage shift versus temperature. I can also use constant voltage mode of operation. So in this case, the output signal will be current shift. Current shift. But look at this device. This is a miraculous device. We already mentioned that the best example is in from biosensing field. Look, one of the trends, very powerful trends in sensor technology is to design multifunctional sensors, multifunctional. So it means that one sensing element is able to measure several quantities. If I'm going to measure concentration of potassium ions inside human body, if I'm going to measure, let's say, uh, blood flow, in arteries, if I'm going to measure certain antibodies concentration, at the first glance, 
I should implant three different sensors, which is a new sound. New sounds for the uh, patient. It's much better to implant one element, one element, which will be able to measure these three quantities. How we can achieve this? In general terms, in general terms, if we look at the P injunction, let's start from the ordinary resistor, ordinary resistor. We have only one degree of freedom. What if the, this resistor is modified in a such a way that, for instance, me measures the gas concentration? What we can do? Not so much. One degree of freedom. We can only measure resistance. That's it. That's it. The end of the story. Resistance changed due to the change in the concentration of gas. But when I am dealing with element, in which there are different physical phenomena, I can employ this phenomena in different ways mm -hmm. to measure more than one physical, chemical, mm -hmm. biochemical quantity. This is the case, this is the case for P injunction because physics of the P injunction, forward bias P injunction, is completely different than physics of the a reverse bias P injunction, especially in the breakdown region. Not only this, not only this. I have two different phenomena in the breakdown range, uh, uh, junction, in the breakdown region. I have Zener breakdown, I have avalanche breakdown. Both of them are characterized by different, by negative and positive signs of temperature sensitivity. So what does it mean? That I can, when I'm changing temperature for such a, for such a, uh, let's put this part. When I'm changing temperature, I can observe this zero sensitivity point. There is a boundary between avalanche and zener breakdown. So in other words, in other words, having the opportunity to use different physical phenomena and having this opportunity of zero point temperature, why is so important? Because one of the environmental factors is temperature. I want to suppress temperature influence on my output signal. I want to compensate temperature. I can employ this. I can employ it. So if you look at the P injunction, I can say I can design very nice dynamic pressure sensor, dynamic pressure sensor. I can measure temperature using this device. And I can also think how to measure acceleration. So I can, using this device, I can design three functional sensors. One element will sense three different quantities. Three different quantities. This is wonderful element. And the same story in optical sensing field, yeah? Which I mentioned last week, that we can use different Parameters, different light parameters, different light parameters. We can play the game with them. So first step, we have to look at the device physics, how we can employ this. The second, the second, I can use the proper signal processing means to process the output signal. And again, this is additional degree of freedom. I can again enrich this multifunctional uh, sensing uh, opportunities. So P injunction, easy element to adapt. I'm buying this for a couple of cents, couple of cents, taking package out and, and putting this again in a bridge configuration.
Very weak. Very weak output signal. <laughs> Do we have better laser pointer? Because this one is difficult to work. There is uh, some trick. Gracias. Mucho gracias. Yeah. Works? You you change the battery location. Ah, contacts, contacts. So it shows clearly that contacts are not good. <laughs> Don't use contacts in a sensor technology. Don't use mechanical contacts. Forget about mechanical contacts. Because the results are not reliable. Yeah? Mechanical contact. Okay, so one arm of the bridge, our P injunction, three resistors, and this is the... Uh, Sensing element, this is for compensation reasons, to compensate some environmental factors. And of course, standard op amp and output voltage. So we can, we can get, uh, in the case when the vo uh, device operates in a forward, but it's a forward bias, it's a forward bias, we can get strong output signal. Now, from Schottky equation, Schottky equation, we can calculate that <coughs> p-injunction temperature sensitivity for forward bias junction is minus 2.3 millivolt per degree centigrade. Yeah, minus 2.3 millivolt per centigrade. Uh, this theoretical value matches very well experimental value, but even if it's like this, we have to calibrate this sensor individually to get a good result. Calibration is necessary. Now, we, what, what we can expect? Good dynamic properties? Good or bad dynamic properties? Very good, yeah, because it's a miniaturized P injunction. Package was taken out. Thermal equilibrium will be reached very quickly. And uh, uh, now, working range typically minus 50 to plus 150. The upper limit is. is uh, uh, set up by the material properties for silicon 150, mm -hmm. sometimes up to 200, but it's not recommended. If we will use our different semiconductors, wide band gap semiconductors, we can also design P injunction from silicon carbide. Wide band <coughs> gap semiconductor, the band gap is for 4.2 electron volts, so in this case we can increase the operational temperature. Uh, at the first glance, at the first glance, without all these peripherals, without all these peripherals, it seems to be that this is low cost sensor, it's a low cost approach, but for precise measurements, precise measurements, it will cost some money. It will cost some money because these peripherals and calibration could be costly. Thermally sensitive mechanical switches used by through ages, but they are not recommended because they are they are they have movable movable uh, mechanical parts. They are widely used for home appliances. 
So let's uh, let's uh, uh, skip them. This slides now. Hewlett Packard is producing temperature sensor based on anisotropic properties of quartz. You know, some time ago I asked you a question if anisotropy is conducive feature for sensing applications, and we discussed this, and we say that it could be very conducive. So, quartz crystal, quartz crystal, this is, this is the same QCM device, QCM device, mm -hmm. which we discussed for mercury vapor. Mm -hmm. Package is taken out, we can use it also for temperature sensing, mm -hmm. that's right. Of course, if we are measuring, if we are measuring mercury vapor concentration, we have to select the crystallographic cut in a such a way that temperature influence will be very low, very low. And it, it is achievable because the temperature sensitivity for such a QCM is in the is of the range 10 to the minus 6 per degree centigrade. 10 to the minus 6 per degree centigrade. So delta F over F0 to delta T 10 to the minus 6 per degree centigrade. Why? Because this element is used as an oscillator. As an oscillator. So it must be high stability. Temperature sensitivity. In the case of temperature sensing, I can select crystallographic cut in a such a way that element is highly temperature sensitive. Highly temperature sensitive. Because of the anisotropy of, of a, a quartz. And they are, there is a temperature sensitivity for different uh, crystallographic planes. As you can see for Pardon me. As, as you can see, for some, for some temperature sensitivity is low, for others is is high. So we can select the right crystallographic cut, crystallographic plane, and we can choose what we want from this element. And Hewlett Packard is making money on this element. Why? It's also so popular because because simple explanation because the output signal is a direct frequency shift direct frequency shift uh, so we have the transfer characteristic frequency shift versus temperature so we can measure temperature very very accurately very very accurately there are also numerous other temperature sensors. And uh, here, last table, last table, comparison between them. Different type of sensors. Advantages, disadvantages. Advantages, disadvantages. Again, please look at the materials used and think in a holistic way which, as you know, most of the medical doctors are not doing when they are treating our diseases, yeah? It's not like this that I'm looking at sensor and only on one part of this and I can conclude something. No, I have to look in a holistic way. Holistic way. I have to have a broad picture. I, 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 have, a, I have a glimpse and I, I'm saying, oh, this sensor number not accepted for me, poor dynamic properties, poor uh, long-term stability. So for this particular application, I'm not going to use it. Yeah? Looking at the arrangement, looking at the materials used, dimensions, and so on, so on. I can conclude a lot, a lot. Not only looking for one element, like a doctor looking for curing kidney and uh, you know, as a result, your liver is, suffers a lot for the rest of your life. Holistic approach, holistic approach. So, the sensor way of thinking, in the next hour we are starting 
the we are starting nano we are starting nano so step by step step by step we will accelerate let's make a coffee break <laughs> coffee is needed because yes. some coffee <laughs> Perfect, you are. 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 Perfect